Welcome to Holly History, where we discuss what you want to hear. No fake news, no alternative facts. Just history, all the time. Greetings from the Holly Central School District Library. This is Holly History, where we discuss what you want to hear. I'm joined by Mike Christmas, Sheena Hammer today, and I'm Nick DeMurro. Um, we want to start off by uh, thanking Glenn Thrower for doing some artwork for us. Uh, we're going to be having new artwork hopefully every episode that we publish, so it should be pretty interesting. Uh, Glenn, I just asked him literally via text a couple seconds ago if it's going to look good. He says good is the only thing he knows, so that should be uh, should come out pretty well. Uh, I want to clear up one thing from the last episode. Uh, I haven't even told you two about this yet. In the last episode... There was a portion we were talking about foreign policy, and I said, uh, it's hard being beneath the United States when it comes to Latin America. And Henry goes, literally or figuratively, and I never responded to that, the term beneath the United States is actually a uh, notable textbook I read in college about foreign Amer- uh, Latin America, U.S. policy, uh, foreign policy during like the 20th century and a little bit before. So that is where the phrase came from. I was in no way <laughs> insinuating that Latin America so is be- is up. beneath the United States in, in any way. Um, so we got a great show. Other than, f- other than geographically. Geographically, right, is it? Yes. that's right. Yes. So, so now that that's all cleared up and we're all set to go, that's, that's great. Um, we got a great show for you today. Today we're not taking any questions from any of you today. Uh, we do need more, though, so make sure you tweet us at Holly History or uh, email us those questions at hollyhistory65 at gmail.com. Uh, don't forget to do that. We'll remind you at the end of the show, too. But today we're going to ask each other questions, and it's going to be largely based around our interest in history. So you'll get to see some of the, our, our viewpoints on things. Uh, I, have, of course, chose the most politically charged question for Mike that I could find. So I'm sure that'll get uh, get interesting. So today we are going to start off. Uh, Mike does something really cool in his class, especially this college history folks. Um, in this, the spe- is it a History Channel special that does uh, that? Yeah, it was a History it's Channel special in the early 2000s uh, titled uh, 10, 10 Days That Unexpectedly Changed America. So I'm here to ask Mike first, uh, what day unexpectedly changed America the most? Well, I'm going to do a shameless plug before uh, we get to the answer. Um, uh, so Holly students, you guys are going to be signing up for classes uh, soon. Uh, Social Studies uh, is offering a number of electives, which includes uh, College U.S. History. We also have uh, new two new college courses coming up, uh, World Civilizations One, World Civilizations II. Uh, and those, that's a way if you like global, uh, you don't, you're not, uh, if you want to get college credit, you're not stuck just taking U.S. History. So we have those through GCC and their ACE program, which credits transfer fantastically. We have psychology coming back, uh, which is always a popular course. Current events coming back, another popular course. Um, We have uh, World Wars coming back, which has been a very popular course this year. And Modern Terrorism, which uh, the department's excited to offer. Um, I was talking with uh, some administrators today, and we were talking about how our students uh, do not know a world before 9-11. And that is, for those of us who are older and listening to this, it's hard for us to imagine what the world was like before that, um, but you know, life existed before 9-11 and all the craziness we have to go through. Um, so getting back to the, the original question about the, the day that unexpectedly changed America, the, the series that the History Channel has truly are 10 different days that you would not expect. Um, I'm gonna give an answer of one in 1A, because that's just how I am. <laughs> okay. Um, my, my favorite episode, and, and truly one of the days that unexpectedly changed America, that really, when you stop and think, has real long-term implications, is Elvis's appearance on tele- first appearance on I television. I was so hoping you were going to pick that I, one. I, I love I the episode because really they bring up so much great stuff about um, you know Elvis uh, as, as a singer. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of folks, when they listened to him on the radio, didn't know he was white. They thought he was African-American. He grew up uh, singing uh, African American spirituals. Uh, he grew up. Um, he actually, when he when he got his start, he actually went to Beale Street in Memphis and got his clothes made in a store that was on the dividing line between the black and the white section of town, and it was really uh, the store where a lot of African Americans went to for their clothing. So, kind of his uh, over the top clothing was was actually meant you know, for the African-American community. So he's really crossing a racial divide. Uh, he's crossing a generational divide because um, 
you know, I, I always joke, jokingly start with the 1920s about jazz music coming out, where it's the end of the Western civilization as we know it, because mm-hmm. it's, you know, has all these, uh, as they put in uh, Better Homes and Gardens, uh, voodoo music, right? <laughs> I mean, just, you know, all this crazy music. Kids are doing all sorts of horrible things. You know, this is the end of the, you know, the, the civilization as we know it. You know, 30 years later, Elvis comes out. You know, he's swinging his hips all over television. Oh, my goodness, what are kids going to think? You know, it's the end of Western civilization. All I can think know of it. is Forrest Gump right now. Yeah, right? Well, <laughs> then, I always love it. You, know, you, fast forward another, <laughs> you fast forward another 30 years. In the 80s, rap comes out. Yeah. And that's the end of Western civilization as we know it. And it's not even music, for goodness sake. Well, right? there's always something wrong with the kids. Oh, yeah. That is one of the best yeah, things of history nobody talks about. There's always something wrong with the kids. The younger generations are always never as good as their parents. And you're hearing right now with millennials, and I'm sure we'll all grow up to be just like, you know, my right. parents. No, absolutely. And and I think that's kind of almost a rite of passage to a certain yeah, degree for a generation to have a set of music that the, the adults don't approve of. You know, go fast forward 30 years from rap, you have Miley Cyrus, right? Oh, my and just, God. And, but that's <laughs> I'm trying a, to forget that. That's exactly what I'm talking about. But um, Elvis is, you know, he's, he's challenging a lot of the social norms. Kids enjoyed the music. They didn't care whether he was black or white or whoever. Uh, it was it was music and it was challenging the authority to a certain degree. Kids always love that. Um, it's it's a fantastic show if you ever get a chance. My one A to that though is um, Freedom Summer. Mm-hmm. And I had read some about Freedom Summer. I actually had uh, I've attended a couple uh, workshops where we talked about Freedom Summer, um, but the. The ending of that uh, that show, they show the um, they show the uh, eulogy of the African American um, gentleman who was killed. It's about the three civil rights workers in Mississippi who are killed, just trying to register African Americans to vote, and the the emotion and passion with which the young man spoke, and I, his name escapes my uh, my memory at this point. Um, you know, he just he got up there and just spoke from the heart, and it was basically. We're not bowing down anymore. I'm tired of I'm tired of going to funerals, and the emotion of it I think really encapsulates that time period of the civil rights movement. Um, it's shocking when they're looking for those three guys, how many bodies they're finding in other places, mm-hmm. and I think it's eye opening to Northerners during the time period. I think it's eye opening to our kids today. Mm-hmm. Um, it's one to, of my favorite uh, films is Mississippi Burning. Yeah, although in Mississippi Burning is interesting because um, it. It is a very entertaining film, but when you look at the real specifics of it, the, there's a lot of uh, inaccuracies mm. in, in, the, in the facts. Um, I think the spirit of it is there, of, of what happened um, in, in the investigation, but um, certainly if you're looking at it for, okay, did they get it historically right? Not exactly 100% dead on. But um, so those are kind of my one and one A. I think those are both really, really great choices. I was hoping you are going to pick the Elvis one. Um, the Freedom Summer one surprised me a little bit, but it's one of those ones I just forgot was there Yeah. when, when thinking about the topic. So, Sheen, I got a question for you. What is the biggest takeaway students should have when it comes to global? We're pretty U.S. dominant, and I think now with, uh, with you know, the New York State now is shifting, the, the global exam is changing. Uh, ninth and tenth grade are the only years in secondary education where students take global education. Seventh is uh, United, early United States history. Eighth grade is modern United States history. Ninth is is global. Tenth is a form of global. Global one and global two. Uh, then there's U.S. and eleventh, and then you're taking Pig and Econ, which is largely U.S. based. Your seniors, so you only get two years of global, and they just alter the test now. The test will now only be uh, testing on the modern stuff, correct? correct? Global 2 stuff. So there's no longer a test on the Global 1 stuff. So Sheena, I wonder what, what, what is the biggest takeaway students should have when it comes to, to Global? Um, I've seen students that I've had in the past out, you know, around and some of them have said things like, oh, I love Geography Challenge. Like, I know eight countries in Africa now. And it's just like, well, shoot, <laughs> that's not that's not what we're going for. Um, I think the biggest takeaway is, like you said, a lot of the history is U.S. history. Uh, global courses give us something to compare ourselves to, not just as Americans, but as human beings. Um, I think a lot of global um, gives us an opportunity to see different cultures, obviously different governments, different ways of doing things, because we're pretty isolated. Um, and... Once you take a look at some global topics, you can look at 
not to compare ourselves, but just without judgment to really examine what makes humans do what they do. Um, mm -hmm. I think a good question that you know Global allows people to do is say, uh, you know, what would I do as a human being during that time period yeah. um, in that part of the world? Is that the way I would act? And just to say, like, look, they believe different things, they wear different things, but to acknowledge that's because of when they're living and where they're living. Um, so that's one of the big takeaways. And I think you guys all pose questions, but if we ask somebody, like, say, imperialism, you know, let's say you're England, you have all the weapons, you have industry, you need resources, what do you think they're going to do? A lot of the kids, without even learning about it, would be able to say, well, they're probably going to take over other areas. It's just, like, what makes people tick a little bit. Why do I go after the British right? like that? You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's interesting, too, because you can look at, and we're going to be focusing on this in our participation in government class, are, are people inherently good or are they oh. inherently bad, <laughs> right? Human nature kind of things. Yeah. And that doesn't, and that transcends everything. Yeah. You know, and there's great examples in global history, um, in addition to, to U.S. history, of our folks inherently good or inherently bad. I think that that philosophical idea drives a lot of what people do. And it doesn't matter whether you're living in 13th century Europe or, you know, 21st century, um, you know, Latin America. Yeah. Those basic things are still there. Absolutely. Yeah. I think too often in modern history, especially with American historians, we have this tendency to think U.S. centric and not put things in a global context, mm -hmm. and even even politically, I think because po historians are political, we're just like any other human being. People of the right and the left. Sometimes we have this tendency to put things in a U.S. centered view, and we forget about the rest of the world and and the context that provides. You know, we're all humans; it's all human experience, mm -hmm. all part of the human story. Uh, and, and it's like I talk, well, this that relates really well to, for example. When I talk about history being like that soap opera, yeah. the, the Dan Carlin idea of history being that TV series where we're all born into it. In order to understand it, you've got to understand the whole story, and the U.S. is not the only story. You know, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense outside of that. So I right, thought it's a good start. We got two what, two questions in here. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right, so. Uh, next question is going to go to Nick, but Sheena's going to ask this oh, one. Oh, yeah, actually, um, Nick, I've, I've been hearing a lot about the World Wars class, and one of the things they've been doing a project on is who is to blame for World War One, and I've heard that in multiple classes. I know it created, you know, a lot of good discussion. I was just wondering, you've probably told your World War students, but which country do you think is to blame for World War One? So, and this is so ironic because I was reading Peter Hart like 10 minutes ago. <laughs> on, on his his uh, assigning of blame for World War One, it's it's one of the most complex questions, but yeah, it's one of my, my favorite questions because there's so many different angles to come at this. The project went really well. The students were assigned countries earlier in the year, and they had to actually argue um, which country was the most responsible and defend their own. So it was really great to see students get assigned a country like Germany, who has traditionally assigned the blame in most histories, uh, have to defend that and and. Not for nothing, did Germany only, I believe, lost in one of the classes. Or was the most guilty nation. Yes. And it was hard for the students to understand that you know, that whole of uh, idea of you don't have to outrun the bear, you have to outrun the slowest person. Just be the least guilty of all these countries. They didn't, they're like, oh, I don't have to prove I'm innocent. And we're like, no, no one's innocent here. Um, there's, there's no exceptions to that. So if I had to say which country was the most guilty, I have them in tiers, uh, kind of like Mike's <laughs> 1A. and <laughs> So I have, I have a 1 and 1A. Notice we never give straight answers. <laughs> yeah. We're like that. We're historians. We don't have to. That's why we're in the humanities. We're not in the sciences. The answer is not necessarily have to be two. Um, I, my first tier is Serbia and Austria-Hungary. They Those two nations are the most are the biggest, uh, the most responsible as far as the immediate causes. Serbia has a ton of high-ranking government officials and military officials involved in the Black Hand. And the Black Hand were the, was the group that sent the weapons and supplies to uh, young Bosnia, of which Givalio Princip was a part of. Um, and, and they, and not for nothing, they assassinate a friendly Slavic leader. Um, the Slavs are looking for their pan-Slavic state. That's what young Bosnia wants in the Balkans there, the country like Greece, Romania. They want a, a pan-Slavic nation in that region. And Serbia is one of the most nationalistic countries in Europe at the time. Germany gets pinned as the nationalistic country, and they for sure were, but don't ignore Serbia. They were extremely nationalistic. And 
young Bosnia is supplied by the Black Hand, who is tied very clearly to the Serbian government. Now, it's up for debate how much the Serbian government knew of this or had any involvement. That's up for debate. Um, and they've been fermenting issues in the Austro-Hungarian Empire for some time. And, you know, they almost use their main ally, Russia, as an ends to achieve that pan-Slavic goal. They almost feel like they can do anything they want. Young Bosnian groups, Black Hand groups, they can almost do anything they want, assassinate whoever they want, because they know should anything happen. And the Serbian government knows this too, Russia will back them up. Everybody sees the, the alliance is maybe secret, but everybody knows where it's going to shake out. So in my opinion, the alliances aren't that secret at all. So, so Serbia is really up there. Um, and and they, when they assassinate the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, he's, he's a friendly, well, he, he himself did not like Slavs, but he's as friendly as a Slavic leader as you're going to get. And so they're assassinating a leader who is desiring to de-escalate tensions. Had they assassinated Franz Joseph, who was the, the crown of the throne, I don't want to say that that's more excusable, but you can understand it. They're assassinating a guy who is trying to de-escalate tensions with the Slavs. Then Austria-Hungary is to blame, too. They wanted to end the Slavic problems. They were looking for an excuse. And the Austro-Hungarian leaders wanted war. Uh, Count Hotzendorf, probably one of the top three most responsible guys of the whole war. He's the head of the, um, the military council in Austria-Hungary. He was prodding for it the whole time. He's the one that seeks out the German blank check. He's in touch with von Moltke, who's the German leader of the military. And when Austria-Hungary sends that ultimatum, Serbia agrees to every demand but one. And it was the demand that Austria-Hungary can go into Serbia, take out the people they think are responsible, and try them in Austro-Hungarian courts. There's not a person on earth or a nation on earth that could agree to that. Um, when Supposedly when the Kaiser saw that uh, that Serbia agreed to everything but one, he said, I see no reason for war. Which, you know, we're, we're if Germany gets the blame. He's telling the Austrian Greens he sees no reason for war. He goes on vacation, but the Austrians declare war anyways. And then in my second tier, you have Germany. Look, they were the most nationalistic, militaristic, out to get their day in the sun, as they called it, of all the European countries. For God's sakes, they called their plan, their war plan, the Schlieffen plan, Der Tag. They called it the day. These people were, were waiting for the day in the sun. And, you know, for God's sakes, the, the war plan calls for invading neutral Belgium. German diplomacy had alienated the Russians and caused a two-front war, um, which put the, the military in a really bad spot. And then Russia, they're in my second tier next to Germany. They're the first outside power to mobilize. Russia kind of gets off the hook here because everybody kind of feels sorry for them dropping out of the war and losing so many men. Um, they're very nationalistic in their own way. They're looking to come out of the, the embarrassment of the Russo-Japanese War. And they're the first ones to mobilize. And as soon as they flick that mobiliz mobilization switch, Germany has to respond and invade Belgium and go into France. And then my last tier are, shockingly, the, the UK. <laughs> of course. The British. I noticed the French are in the The French are in the bottom, too. So, you know, I'm, I'm somewhat fair. Uh, the, the British did not mediate that Balkan dispute. They've done that in the past. And many historians suggest that... You know, the British had a duty as the top power in the world to mediate the dispute, and they kind of just sat on their hands for a long time. They also never told Germany, hey, if you invade Belgium, we're in. There was no real clear moment where they said what they were going to do, which is why some people think the Germans invaded through Belgium, that maybe the Germans wouldn't have done it if the British had been more firm. Don't know if I buy that completely, but the, the British definitely should have sat on their hands. And the French, they're just poking the Russians, basically, and saying, you know, hey, you want to go after Germany? They're supplying the, the Russians with tons of money uh, throughout the whole thing, just dying to get that ter those territories of Alsace and Lorraine back. You know, it's funny how that territory right there alone has been the most fought-over territory in the whole 20th century, if you think about it. Right. This little gap between Germany and France that they can't seem to sort out <laughs> since 1870 and beyond. So those are my rankings, but I, I put Serbia and Austria-Hungary together at the top, for sure. Well, I'll, I'll be honest. When I was in school, I wish there had been a better explanation of Serbia and what was going on there. They they, they get the victim yeah. card. Yeah, they totally all the do. time. And 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 I and it's tough in the global class because you are trying to. I mean, by the time you get to to World War II, you're under the gun as far as time. the Regents' yeah. exam. Yeah, <laughs> and. Um, I, the one thing I've been really enjoyed about this World Wars class is we can really get into the really the real nuances of what's going on, mm -hmm. right? And I think Nick's right. Serbia gets a pass a lot, not only just because 
they're not one of the big powers, but they're a small, more really tiny country. And how can yeah. you blame this tiny little country for this you know, massive war? And I think they, they do hold a lot of the blame. Austria-Hungary, I think you're right, is 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 right up there too. Because there's, it's not that the assassination happens and the next day there's war. There's this time period of posturing and mobilizing and all sorts of craziness. That in that time, if somebody would have had the ability or the guts to do it, they might have been able to negotiate their way out of it. But I think that the the, um, the terms that were thrown out there, just nobody could live with. Mm-hmm. And that's, yeah, it, it, that's a tough one. It, 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 the popular response today has been that everybody's responsible. And I don't like they sound doing like, that. They sound like a historian. They sound I know, like I, don't, I don't like doing that. <laughs> but you know what, Peter Hart, back to Peter Hart, he, he did bring up a good point. He goes, Germany's still at the center of it. You can't, as far as the immediate causing countries, it's, I think it's Serbia, Austria, Hungary, because they can't seem to sort out their own war. But Germany, in the decades before, I mean, they go out and build a navy to challenge Britain. There's no if and buts about that. But in the end, Germany gets, they try to squash Germany like a bug because they're, they're, the they're the new kid in the block. They're yeah. trying to prove themselves. And so therefore, I, I view the, the Treaty of Versailles as the old powers trying to make sure they, they stay in power and these new powers that are up mm-hmm. and rising are put in their place. Yeah. Now that backfires, of course, but at the time, that, it's self-preservation for the old empires. I, I think Britain in particular. Yeah, Britain tries to cleverly hide behind uh, an aggressive Clemenceau at Versailles, I think. I think they're very happy with punishing the Germans. And because Dave Lloyd George is not the Prime Minister of Great Britain at the time, right. doesn't put up too much of a stink, I guess you could say. Uh, when you have that odd that odd three of uh, Woodrow Wilson, Clemenceau, and <laughs> David Lloyd know, George. I would love to know what the, the Europeans were actually thinking. With when Wilson's, Wilson's, was Wilson's talking. ideas of let's outlaw war, yeah. let's you know, it, let's let's talk it out, right? Sit around mm-hmm. the campfire and sing kumbaya all the time. I just want a picture um, of Clemenceau's face. All right, when that happens. Well, especially in the fact that the the French lost way more than the Americans. Oh did. my gosh! Did not just people wise, but look at you know, look at territorial like yep. what's been destroyed, what's left over. I mean, the Americans are pretty much untouched mm-hmm. by World War One. Yeah, not even one hundred fifty thousand cashes. Yeah. The French lose more. Or deaths, I should say. The French lose more in 1914 in the first couple right. months. I mean, in three days, 75,000 dead. And that's not to that's not to uh, belittle lo- American losses. No, you know, no. By, by any stretch of the imagination. But when you're talking sheer numbers, it's just Americans static. have always had low cash numbers, though, compared to other nations. Well, we're wars. Johnny Come Lately twice. Yes, yes. So. All right, Sheena. Uh, we've done this question kind of before, but I want to hear your answer more in depth. You do this with your global classes. Uh, who's the most evil and the worst ruler of all time? And I, we talked about the one you're going to talk about. I'm wondering if you can give me a second one too, maybe a little. This is like a quick little. Snack. Another one. So you want a one 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 a I, thinking about them from the psychological perspective, and psychology will be available in the fall. Uh, you can learn more about psychopaths. <laughs> um, but both Hitler and Stalin were, you know, power hungry. Um, you can think of them as only being about the power, not a lot of like loyalty and humanity, obviously. It's just how do I achieve the most power? Um, Stalin more so, I feel like. Um, because Hitler actually bought his ideology. I right, think. right. Mm-hmm. He actually believed it. And, mm-hmm. and that, that doesn't excuse anything, let me say that now, so I have to do another like d- uh, disclaimer the next right. show. But Yeah, no, Stalin, Stalin was not really loyal. Obviously, he'll pair with whoever will get him the most power. Some people have questioned if he was you know, truly into the, the communism part or he just wanted to, to get the most power, so he joined that mm. in, in with that ideology. Um, but Stalin, okay, so Stalin ruled for a longer period of time. That's something I'd have to consider in coming up with the answer. Mm. Um, obviously, you could compare, like, the concentration camps during the Holocaust of Hitler with the gulag that mm. Stalin created, both horribly inhumane. You know, lots of people, obviously killed in those. I think that Hitler usually tops it off because of the systematic planning and how carefully the Holocaust was um, executed and how many people were killed in such a short amount of time. Um, So I think that that's one of the reasons why I feel 
if I really examined it, looking at the two people and looking at how horrible they were in general, I feel like if Hitler had ruled for 30 years, the numbers would far outweigh Stalin. Yeah. So as a leader, I see him as more evil. That's that's a great point, and I've actually never thought of that way, the, the time of, of, of ruling. You know, the, the thing, too, is what's so uh, – the fact that we're having a conversation. Both these guys in the 20th century, when we thought we outlived – Yeah. We, 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 were, we were above the civilized because you, if you put Hitler in the ancient Assyrians um, I'm seeing Dan Carlin here if you put Hitler in the ancient Assyrians right he's just your run of the mill oh, yeah. average right. awful slu- you know if Stalin's a Mongol average right. part of the reason these guys are so bad is because Mike I don't know what you're going to say but <laughs> no, I can't fine. wait um, <laughs> they're in the they're in a time period and this stuff is so unusual you know what they did particularly was not unusual it was another day in the park but it's when they're doing it so to, I'm gonna I'm gonna meld two two questions together here. So unexpected dictators who are horrible. Oh my gosh, right? And and again, and and, and you brought this up, and I had them written down and didn't even think about it. But mm-hmm. they are more modern. Yep. In the historical timeline. Okay. Pol Pot. Yes. Yeah. In Cambodia, I know who we overlook a lot. We do yeah. horrible. And just horribly bad. Yeah. Right. Second um, worst genocide, I think. I believe so. It's like just like four million deaths. Yes. Uh, yeah, but it, but again, relatively short period of time, yep. and that's a that lasting legacy. I mean, mm-hmm. it's still going on in Southeast Asia. Yeah, another one, and students, you need to look this one up because I know we don't cover it a whole lot, yep. if at all, in global. That's Idi Amin. Yeah, yeah. I, I was oh, waiting for you to say that. that. He's yeah. Oh my goodness! I, you read about him, and you're just like, what is going on? How could anybody back a guy like that? But again, it comes back to how can anybody psychologically pack back anybody mm-hmm. like Stalin yeah. or Hitler? But Idi Amin's up there, and then you know, one A um, in Haiti, you had mm-hmm. Papa Duck and Baby Duck, who are if you don't know anything about Haitian history, I mean Haitian history is just just fraught with yeah. bad leadership, and those guys are just incredibly bad, not just for their countries, but for the people right. of those countries, and you see that lasting legacy. With what happened with the hurricane and the earthquake in, in Haiti, none of the infrastructure is there because it hasn't been there to begin with, and that's because of these guys and their and their dictatorships and what they've done. So, just kind of an interesting, you know, Hitler and Stalin are always the ones everybody yes. thinks of. But again, we go back to that idea of these are more these are twentieth century people. We think we've moved past that. Well, have we? I was going to say, have we moved I past know. that? I, I think that's a whole show in of itself. Or is the technology better enough that these horrible people can do worse things in a relatively short period of time? And it, the fact that it is a short period of time is because of the modern day and the technology. That right. we, it won't go on mm-hmm. as long, I guess you could say. I was surprised when I brought up Saddam Hussein and some of the things he did to have. I guess it was, I just wasn't thinking like that, but some of the kids were like, who? Like Saddam yeah. Hussein, they don't associate him, or it wasn't in their you know, memory. He, he's yeah. another one you would yeah. put in that in that top ten. If you, I guess, if you had to pick like post death of Stalin, right? Worst dictators. What a list you could make, yeah. right? What a list you could make. I think all the people we just named probably deserve to be on there. Um, oh, would Mao make the list? You think? Oh, I think so. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, Ho Chi Minh. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, you know, just in, in places in the world you wouldn't necessarily think yeah. of sometimes, mm-hmm. too. Yeah, no, absolutely. So that brings us to the most politically charged question of the day, and I've been waiting for this for so long. Um, question for Mike. <laughs> Should Confederate monuments be removed from public places? And the reason I'm asking him is because I think Mike and I share a very similar opinion on this because we've talked about it before. Um, so, Mike, what do you think? Well, Sheena's laughing because she's she's glad she didn't get that question. <laughs> <Absolutely. Yes. laughs> um, it, you know, this is interesting. We were actually talking about my class at one point in one of my periods because we were talking about freedom of speech and freedom of expression and all those things. I'm not sure where I really stand at this point. I think certainly Confederate monuments should not be in... Um, public places and public spaces, and by that I mean spaces that are funded by the government or belong to the government. Um, I've been to places in the South, Atlanta in particular, where they had uh, Confederate monuments on the governor's, uh, or I'm sorry, on the, the, the property where the legislature meets. Um, they had a Confederate flag there on the, the state territory. Um, 
I don't think that we need to get rid of them altogether. As a matter of fact, I think that's completely, histor- as a historian, as, that's irresponsible. The appropriate places for them to be put are battlefields and museums um, where folks can reflect. I think it's important, no matter what battlefield you're talking about, to show both sides. Um, you owe that to the soldiers who gave what Lincoln would have called the last full measure, right? A mm-hmm. last full measure of devotion because they're fighting not for ideological terms. We always, you know, in class we will, we talk about these big, big issues as to why people are fighting. But you talk to the average guy who's in the trenches during World War One, who's standing in line in the Civil War. They're not fighting for the big overarching issues. They're fighting for very personal and philosophical reasons. We have to recognize that and to a certain degree honor that. And, you know, it, it, as much as we vilify the enemy, which is, I think, is an important part of propaganda to winning a war, you also have to recognize the humanity mm-hmm. of what's going on there. Um, with that said, you know, it, it's. To, to do a blanket statement of yes, we need to get rid of them all, or no, we should get rid of them, uh, should not get rid of them all, I think would be irresponsible either way. You know, it, it, it brings up, though, interesting discussions about symbolism and um, when the, they were put up. When they're put up, the lost cause narrative oh, of, yeah. you know, that, you know, the, oh, the, the poor Southerners, you know, they never stood a chance and, um, and they're heroic for, for fighting it out. You know, they're, they're like the 300 of Thermopylae, uh, which they're not. Um, and it, it leads to other questions, too, about the Confederate flag, uh, which has been brought up. We talk about every year in our class. I'll be honest, it is probably one of the most uncomfortable conversations we have in my class, but I, I take it on willingly because I think it's an important one. Mm-hmm. Um, I do think it's interesting. Some southern states still have the Confederate flag, the Confederate battle flag, to be, to be more accurate, on their state flag. Uh, Mississippi, in particular, I mean, since I've been in college, yeah. In the '90s, they they've been talking about oh, we should get rid of this. You know, this is I I would have a hard time uh, being an African American living in Mississippi and accepting that as my state flag. Yep. Um, and those discussions need to happen. And um, I attended a conference many years ago where you know a guy talked about African American gentleman talked about we need to have these discussions. We need to open them up. We cannot shy away from them. Uh, he said, you know, we have an open wound in our country, and it's called racism and, and you know, before that, slavery. And the only way to, to deal with a wound is to treat it and to, and to keep taking care of it. Um, and he felt very strongly that uh, we, we need to have these discussions in class. And I, I, I think that's the right thing to do. trick is, as teachers, is, is to keep that uh, conversation um, historically accurate, um, factual, and to try and keep emotion out of it as much as possible, yeah, which is true. really tricky, because uh, that flag, that especially that battle flag, okay. And I have some seventh grade students out there who keep talking to me about that flag. I want them to do the research on it, find out what that <laughs> flag really represents. Um, you know, what does it what does it truly represent? In especially in what time period? Um, the flag that Confederate it went battle away. flag it went away was gone from yeah. roughly after the Civil War up through the nineteen into the nineteen twenties. It will disappear during the Depression and um, during World War II, for the most part, makes a reappearance during the Civil Rights Movement. And then again, disappears after that, makes a reappearance. And one of the connections I made in my room, my classroom, is um, you know, one of the people to kind of um, to kind of bring back that Confederate battle flag, believe it or not, is Jeff Foxworthy. Because that flag for a while represents people who are rednecks. Well, yeah. when I was growing up, if you called somebody a redneck, those are fighting words because you're basically dumb white trash. Okay. Well, what is what does Jeff Foxworthy do? He turns it into a punchline, which is why I've always told my students. You know, when when somebody uh, is making fun of you, accept it, right? Take own whatever it is they're calling you, right? When I was in school, we were called band geeks because I was in the band. And we were like, you're darn right we are. And we actually had shirts made that said, I'm a band geek, right? Because it disarms the other person. Mm-hmm. And so that, that I mean, you might be a redneck if is incredibly funny, but also has brought forward that whole that whole idea again. So Yeah. And, and you bring up a good point. I think it's the way we have those conversations that's important from both sides. I think I think there needs to be empathy, understanding on the subject. And, and battlefields have actually, Gettysburg opened it up and said, if you have a monument, bring it here. And I think that's a really great way to handle it. 
because I'm, I'm Mike. I'm totally with you on on this whole thing. I, it, taking them down or moving it only creates anger, more animosity, a revenge mentality, uh, and, and and a defensive mentality that is only going to breed more problems down the road. We got to find some kind of compromise, um, because at the end of the day, you know, the Confederacy was a traitorous nation that left the North. They did fire the first shots of Fort Sumter upon the election of Lincoln. There's, there's no getting around that. Um, they may have had their own ideas of what Lincoln was going to do, and that caused them to do that, they could say. They do call it the War of Northern Aggression sometimes, down south. Um, but, you know, I think it's important to understand that a lot of these people that fight in these armies are, are pawns caught up in the gears of war. And I think the same can be said of the Soviet Army in World War II. The same can be said of the German Army in World War II. And a lot of other tyrannical states. You know, they... And we talked about this earlier, Mike. We don't flaunt the British flag out there. No. Why is that? You know, and I'm an, and it's coming from an Anglophile. I wish we did a little bit more. I, you know, I love I love the United States of America, but I I love our British roots too. I think we should admire those more. Well, it doesn't even have to be a tyrannical government, right? No, look, it doesn't. Look at uh, people who served in Vietnam. Yep. You know, there were there were volunteers, and they're not volunteering for the big overarching concepts. They're they're volunteering for very specific and philosophical reasons. In some cases, not volunteering at all. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, so that those are things to keep in mind as well. And I, I think you're right. Those conversations, they're, they're touchy conversations, um, and they can go sideways as a teacher incredibly fast. Yeah. Um, and and one of the tricks is just to try and try and create that atmosphere of everybody has something to, to contribute, and even if you disagree, it's okay to listen to what the other person has to say. Absolutely. Which has been tough after our. Some of our uh, our politicians and the way their conduct, and I'm talking about both sides of the aisle. Now, <laughs> so, I think that's going to move us to the next question, right? which is yours, I, I believe, believe, right? Yeah, it's yeah. Mine. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, I'm this challenge. This question isn't going to be too challenging for Nick. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going ni I'm going to be nicer than he was to me. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, Nick, I know you you've uh, you read extensively on the French and Indian War and the American Revolution. You reenact those time periods as well, or have reenacted in the past. So my my question really simply is this: Without the French and Indian War, if it doesn't never exists, does the American Revolution actually happen? And and, and you can you can uh, interpret that however you want. <laughs> so will the will the Americans ever declare their independence, or will they end up like a Canada or? Or in Australia, where it's more, much more like bequeathed to them. <laughs> Just you're gonna upset a lot of people. The Americans end up like Canada. <laughs> Listen to this show. Only, if, only if they live where you grow up. <laughs> I yeah. <laughs> there we go. All right. I was so happy when I, I, I read this question. The answer is no way, not a chance. I don't think that there is an American Revolution without a French New War. Um, I just got done with Fred Anderson's for the second time. I read it, uh, the war that made America about the French New War, and it. I don't. I don't think it happens. I do think it will be like a Canada or a uh, an Australia because the burden of empire for Britain was was real, and they figured that out in the 18th century. Uh, the the Seven Years' War, as the French New War is called around the world, may have made the British Empire, but it also crippled it because they discovered that you know they get the British even get involved in the Philippines and figure out the hard way that. You can't subjugate people if they're not on board, at least easily. And it, you have to do things that make you uncomfortable to subjugate those people, like massacres or, you know. Um, in the Boer War, it will be concentration camps. Not the same as Hitler, but just literally concentrating enemy combatants who there might help the, the um, enemy combatants being civilians who might help the people out in the bush who are fighting you in a guerrilla style. But... There's no way that the revolution happens. And the reason for that is that William Pitt, he's going to become the leading war authority in the middle 1750s, I'm sorry, late 1750s in Britain. And his strategy will vastly depart the British strategy. Early in the war, the British strategy is uh, the colonies have to fight for this stuff because they're in with it. Uh, they have to fight the French and the Indians in, in different um, regions of the, of the colonies and in Canada, and they have to pay for it. They have to, early in the war, um, there's not promises of reimbursement. They have to levy troops. William Pitt changes all that. All of a sudden, he just says, look, I'll pay you for whatever you need. We'll reimburse you for whatever we need. Let's get this done. And colonial support swells. 
it just they start raising thousands of more troops. Um, army numbers the French cannot compete with. Montcalm and Vaudreuil are just up to their neck in uh, in problems with the French leaders during the time. But even above that, it gave colonists this idea, and this is Fred Anderson saying, uh, that they were partners in empire, that they were equals with the British, and that, uh, that it was their duty to do this with the British, and they were very proud to be British. They were happy to be British subjects. They, it's almost like the, the hands stretched across the Atlantic that were in this together for empires. And under leadership, uh, Pitt's leadership, not only were they reimbursed handsomely and promised reimbursement and promised more money in, in this struggle, but um, the officers even had a little bit more leverage than they had in the past under the leadership of Pitt, even though the British at no point in this time see it that way. They never see their colonists as equals. And that comes after the war. So psychologically, when those taxes hit, when the proclamation of 1763 hits, I'm not just talking about the economic burdens. I'm not just talking about the stuff that was promised. Psychologically, it's a big whoa. We're not partners in empire. They don't see us as equals. They're not going to give us representation in parliament. And they're going to continue to tax us, continue to do these things, and quash what we want um, regardless of whether what we think of being partners in empire. We're not really partners in empire. So when they're denied that representation in parliament and any kind of say whatsoever, it's shocking. But then colonists begin to stop seeing themselves as British. Well, make it more complex than that, I'm going to give a quick shout out to Fred Anderson because I worked with him for a week at University, he's a, of, he's Miami, an awesome University of Miami in Ohio on a teacher conference called America's Small Wars. And we talked about the French and Indian War. And Fred's a great guy and a fantastic book if you've, if you've never had a chance to read it. It's a great book. Um, but that fact that the American, uh, American soldiers are treated so much as lesser soldiers than British. You know, a, a, a colonial colonel mm-hmm. ha, has less authority than a British lieutenant. You know, in even the, an ensign, r- even, even an ensign, ensign early right, in yeah. the war. Yeah, yeah. In, in the in the in the command structure, that's not supposed to work that way. No. So the Americans are not seen or treated as equals, and I think part of that leads to that as well. Um, you know, it'd be interesting too. I think to know, you know, what would what would happen to Samuel Adams? You know, he, he fails at everything in life except causing trouble. Yeah. Um, you know, he, he fails at how many businesses. What would happen to George Washington? What would happen to all these other all these yeah. other folks? You know, Jefferson, um, you know, uh, John Hancock, Thomas Paine, all that. If that war isn't there to create that that tension, mm-hmm. so I, it, you know, good. I, I I agree with the analysis. Really, I, although I I think at some point I think it would be sooner rather than later, Britain would have to relinquish control of the colonies. Yeah, the, the administration of it would just cost too much money. Right. It, they, there's no way they could have kept it up. But an interesting thought, nonetheless. Uh, Sheena, your last question. I know you got to step out. Uh, who is your favorite Roman figure? And I love this question because I'm, I'm Roman. Family near there still. <laughs> And when, when you threw out there, you like Roman stuff, I was like, oh, i got to ask a Roman question. Who's your favorite Roman figure? Um, I would probably pick Marcus Aurelius. What choice. Excellent choice. Uh, <laughs> and it's not even, obviously, um, a Roman ruler has certain military strengths and strategy, and he did, you know, to defend the empire. Um, but my interest in him is more about the philosophy part of it and how he, you know, really embraced Stoicism and how he focused in in his writings the meditations he kind of gives advice that i think still holds true today like he was writing these thoughts in 161 and a lot of the stuff you could still see like as a quote today that people would be like oh wow that's that's (laughs) so insightful um some business magazines and you know articles that try to teach people how to be a good leader how to be a good businessman they still embrace Hmm. his teachings and the whole idea of stoicism i find personally interesting because it's about like resiliency if you you know if the um, <clears throat> listeners at home know about Marcus Aurelius and Stoicism. Stoicism is kind of about understanding fate and being resilient and using reason. Um, and you don't you don't see that information about all the leaders in Roman history. You learn mm-hmm. more about you know military and how they built the empire up. I just I find him fascinating. Some of the things that he says, like basically expect people to be corrupt, expect people to lie, but it's really important that we're here to cooperate no matter what. And some of the quotes out there, if you put them on your Pinterest board, they're really <laughs> helpful. Uh, and just the fact that he carried on the Greek ideas of philosophy mm-hmm. and really yeah. embraced those in 
wrong. And he was in the movie Gladiator. I was there. I was there. I was there. It was there. <laughs> Um, it, well, I, I said to Sheena before we started the episode, he was the last really yeah, seen kind of the great Roman emperor of, of the West anyways, which is unfortunate, um, you know, because so much of that time period gets lost. And the, Alex, the, the Alexandrian library is gone. Uh, we, we lose so much. At least we have him him still around. And you get such a bias with Roman historians too, whether it's like Livy or Polybius. The, the bias is so there. It's nice to see something like that that isn't about – Politics, warfare, it's just writing and, and, and the scholarship of it. It is it is fascinating. It was a, that was an excellent choice, Sheena. And next, Mike, we are going to hit you with... Was Robert E. Lee an overrated general? I've been thinking about this one for a while. <laughs> so is Lee overrated? I, in a word, no. He is not overrated. Um... He uh, Lee is dealt a not dealt a bad hand. He chooses a bad hand because he had the chance. Yeah, yes. that's important. And and he he purposefully uh, would not accept uh, the command of the United States Army. He was not willing to invade his homeland, his mm-hmm. home, his, what he called his homeland, which is his home state. Um, a very good friend of mine, uh, Sean Hearn, um, did his undergrad uh, final paper, senior thesis on Lee. And it stuck with me all these years. And he, he talked about Lee is fighting um, a defensive offense. Yeah. I, yeah. Lo- I love the phrasing because he's he's picking the ground in which he's fighting. Um, he's purposeful in doing that. And when he does that, he's successful. Mm-hmm. When he launches his attacks into the north, only twice, in Tetum and Gettysburg, he fails. Um, and he's he's handcuffed because he has a small army, which he does all sorts of things that break all the rules of war and, and what you're supposed to do and yeah. not supposed to do tactically. Divide your forces, divide them twice, divide them three times. Um, Supply-wise, he's he's having real difficulties, especially as the blo- the northern blockade takes real effect. Could you say he was forced to invade the north, though, knowing that... Prolonging that defensive war, I think both. Successful. I think both invasions were were more political than they were tactical. Right. I mean, politically, he's invading Maryland to try and get himself into Washington D.C. Mm-hmm. or at least for convince Marylanders to secede. Maryland secedes, the war's over because mm-hmm. uh, Washington D.C. is an enemy territory. Has to invade Pennsylvania to try and get around to the northern edge of Washington D.C. Again, trying to force the North to end the war. Right. Um, but once once those two battles, Antietam and, and Gettysburg, really take place, it, they're not getting much help from the outside. Mm-hmm. Um, the war, you know, after the Emancipation Proclamation in Antietam, the the European powers cannot um, and will not refuse to back a uh, slave holding uh, nation like the Confederate States. Um, I, I do give Lee credit too in the fact that he actively encourages his men not to fight an insurrection. Once the war mm-hmm. is over, he yeah. tells them to go home, live your life. Right, um, you know we are all Americans again, uh, and that's important. You know, not just with with Lee doing that, but with Grant doing that. Uh, it would have been very easy for him to say, "Go home, go to the hills, fight it out." Right, make life difficult for the North, draw, pro- prolong the war. Um, but I think he saw the end game, and the end, the end game was up at, mm-hmm. at, at Appomattox. I think even after Petersburg, he's. I mean, he's just scratching and clawing to, to, to keep alive. Um, so I don't think he's overrated. I, I, I think he, again, chose a bad hand, did the best he could with it. Um, Do you think he is the best Confederate general, though? The best Confederate general. I think he's, he's one of. I don't know if he could be considered the best. Mm-hmm. Jackson is, is cut down... Uh, early in the war, well, mid part of the war by his own men out on accident. Mm-hmm. I think Longstreet is taking a bad say. he's taking a bad rap. He's probably one of uh, one of Lee's more solid generals. The the whole Jackson thing though, Lee has to reorganize his, his entire army mm-hmm. after he loses Stonewall Jackson. And Jackson, although might not be the, the greatest tactician, he's an inspirational leader. Who took over? Was it A.P. Hill? He, had a, he actually reorganized the divisions. Yeah. So he, instead of having just Jackson, he divides it between Hill and, um, oh, I can't remember the other Hood? guy's name. Um, no, Hood, I think, is, is a divisional commander. 
But um, oh, I can't remember the name now. I used to know it at one point. This is monks. That's a moment just for you. <laughs> um, but so instead of having instead of having two large armies, he now has three. Right. And they're smaller, and and that gives him some some leeway. And you know, the one guy that kind of gets a bad rap too is uh, Jeb Stewart. Yeah. Um, Yes, he's young. Yes, he's petulant. Yes, he's full of himself. Gettysburg. But he he gets the job done. Yeah. You know? Um, but he's given, and in my estimation, he is given poor orders by Lee mm-hmm. in the Gettysburg campaign. And, and he do, he executes his orders, as there are, but uh, does not keep, uh, doesn't keep contact with Lee, and that, that's a problem. I agree Longstreet gets a really bad rap. I mean, he became Republican after the war, mm-hmm. somewhat supported African-American rights. Much more than any of his other people surrounding him. Well, and, and sees the reconciliation process yeah. is important. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and like his monument at Gettysburg, I believe, is put up in the nineties. Yes, it's and that's late. and that's his first monument. He, he yeah. is not seen anywhere. Yeah. And I would I would argue that Longstreet might not be the best of those three that you mentioned, but I think he's the steadiest, mm-hmm. and I think he was the most important piece. Doesn't mean he's the best, but I think he was the most important piece. If I had to pick one of the three, go win me a battle, I'd probably pick Jackson. Well, why Trot not? Any guy who eats lemons while and, he's fighting yeah, a battle and raise one hand yeah. to keep, you know, raise one hand to keep the blood balanced, you can kind of respect that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so then right. we have one so question left. Last right? question, yeah. right? So I'm gonna I'm gonna go back to to your buddy Benedict Arnold. Oh, okay. <laughs> so it, I'm I'm in the middle of book of, of the book uh, Bill O'Reilly's book, Killing England. Mm. A good a, a good read. Um, I know O'Reilly has, uh, you know, political uh, political leanings and things like that, but his books are are, are pretty solidly put together. Uh, the whole Killing series, Killing Lincoln, uh, Killing Jesus, Killing Patton. Mm-hmm. This newest one's Killing England. Uh, talking about Arnold, um, and this you know this is a question, and I know you know Benedict Arnold better than I do, um, as someone who's read a lot about him. So. Benedict Arnold, right, most famous traitor in American history, which I know, I, I know that beguiles you, <laughs> uh, because he he also was a, a, a brilliant commander, um, and, and the victim. A lot of, like Jackson, of, victim actually. of some circumstances as well. So I guess it comes down to this: with Benedict Arnold, what? So what's the deal? Is he a victim of his own personality? No. Oh. That he feels he's not getting enough um, credit for what happened at Saratoga. And Ariskany and other places, uh, including the invasion of Canada, mm-hmm. or is he captive to Peggy Shippen, oh. his his wife? Uh, and there's historians who who claim that Peggy Shippen uh, was able to convince him to, to drop the Patriot side, mm-hmm. uh, and there are others who claim that uh, that he's a victim of his his own arrogance. So, what say you? Yeah, <laughs> well, I mean, the, the the he at Saratoga, he is the guy that. Turns the tide of that battle, uh, despite Gates at Quebec. He launched one. Still studied his invasion today. Um, but the the most important was the Champlain campaign, because he builds that navy out of nowhere. The first navy, sixteen ships outnumbered two to one, and holds up the British invasion of seventy six for a whole year. If that British invasion is able to make it down the Champ, uh, make it down Champlain and cut off Washington when teaming up with Howe, war is over. Uh, so I think that is his most important one, but. I'm actually going to go with neither of those choices. Of course like, you are. The victim personality or, 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 or shipping. It has to do more with the first one, though, definitely. And I think it is tied to it. Arnold grew up uh, poor in a world where you were judged completely by you know what you made and stuff like that. And he did have a chip on his shoulder his whole life. Uh, he did sacrifice personally for the for the cause, and when you put him side by side with Washington, Dave Palmer does that great work that we we've both read. You put him side by side, Washington was able to sacrifice those things and have awful things said about him, not get credit. Arnold wasn't. He wasn't that kind of guy. He wasn't a politician. He had a horrible temper. But in my opinion, and history's kind of taken odd ways of this. Um, initially, the historiography was Arnold did it because he was evil and. He was possessed by the devil. Uh, it, it then he, the first positive biography gets written in eighteen about the eighteen eighties about him, um, but it went from that to it went from the devil to he was driven completely by money. To um, then in the nineteen twenties, thirties, forties, we got the letters from Shippen, and we figured out that she was complicit in the whole thing. It was thought for a long time she was a babe in the woods, had no clue, and uh, we find out she's a, and then oh my god he was totally duped by a woman and everything like that manipulated and then it kind of came back to the money argument for a little bit but just recently 
it's kind of people are starting to argue. Uh, Kirby, James Kirby Martin argues this in his book uh, Bang Down Revolutionary Hero, which was the first one I read on him, and I agree with it that he thought he was doing the right thing. In his own mind, he was self convinced. He writes a letter after it happens to the American people saying, come with me, I've lost my faith in representative government. He sees how Congress has slighted him, how, he's, how Congress has slighted Washington. They can't do anything. The opposite of progress is Congress. They can't do anything at all. <laughs> they, they're corrupt as all get out. We have to make this right and go back with Britain and the people we belong with. We are British. He also hated the French and didn't like that we were getting cozy with them. He did not like Catholics. But I really believe in his heart of hearts and his own mind, he thought he was going to be the hero that did the right thing. It would give him that, 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 that ending he wanted, which is to be recognized and to be the hero and for them to work out for him. And, you know, just to, to segue on this, I wrote my master's thesis in this, and that is we honor Lee. We honor Confederates. It's great that you picked this question because it brings it back around. We honor these people, but yet we, we look at Arnold as the most vile thing ever. A guy that we would not have won the war without. But I don't think there's a question. Yeah. Without Arnold, you don't win the war. No, and, and even people who despise him will often begrudgingly admit that, um, that we would not have won the war without him. But I really do think in his own mind, he thought he was doing the right thing and bringing us back into the bosom of Britain, and that was the right thing to do. Well, again, again, bringing part of it full circle again, it's, it's fighting for your own personal philosophy. Exactly. Not for, not yeah. for these overarching ideas and ideals, you know, and, and that's that's what makes studying people like Arnold interesting. That's what makes studying people like uh, Marcus Aurelius interesting yes. because it's it's not the big things. It's the little things that matter. Well, my, my dad read the Kenneth Roberts books, Arundel, mm-hmm. Oliver Wiswell, and, and he would read a lot of the stories to me as a kid, and that's when I fell in love with Arnold because he was so courageous and dashing. I mean, he does just the craziest things. You know, riding into Saratoga. Like, th- there's accounts. People thought he wanted to die. Yeah. A lot of people thought he wanted to die. He loses his wife. He's, he's depressed a lot. A lot of people thought he was trying to die. When he gets shot in the knee, supposedly he says, I wish it had been my heart. Could you imagine? He'd be on money right yeah, now. No, absolutely. He'd probably be on money right now if that had happened. But I think that was a great show. Uh, while you're here, though, while we're both here, I want to just, we're going to actually put the, the Audacity, which is a recording program, to the side here. Glenn sent us the picture. Oh boy. And I think we should have a live reaction as to kind of what this looks like. So let, we got our new Holly webpage here. All right, go to the staff. All Glenn, right. Glenn, this better be good. Yeah, Glenn, it, the he expectations said one, are high. He said one came out blurry. So just so you know, one is in a, a painting of the Roman Senate, and the other one is the death of Wolf. So he's just sent us the death of Wolf one, um, which is the French Indian War. Shocking that I picked that one. See how it looks. Oh my God, <laughs> that is awesome, Glenn. You 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 outdid yourself. That is for honestly. sure. Who's Wolf? Am I Wolf? I it, I'm I dead. Think... <laughs> of course he killed me. Hang on. Oh my God. Yeah. yeah oh wolf. yeah. Very nice. Who's Sheena? Sheena's the officer Very nice. trying to help yeah. me. Mike, you're holding the flag, and Votri's in the back of you. Where's Henard? He's in the back. He's in the back. Nice. in the back. You can barely see him. And, and, and Dan Light. And Dan nice. Light's behind. Very, very well done, Oh, Glenn. my gosh. Very well played, sir. We're going to have to get Glenn some more artwork to <laughs> uh, to put up. I think we talked about John Trumbull's The Declaration, right? Being a possibility. Yes. So thank you for joining us today. We we, we kept that show on, I think, a uh, good time. Looks like we're just under an hour here. I know some of you said you get a little tired of the longer episodes, so we're going to try to keep them kind of shorter. Make sure you email us, hollyhistory65 at gmail.com, or tweet us some questions at hollyhistory. We hope to bring you some more episodes. So we were gone for a while. We had the holiday break there. We're, we're back in the studio, though, and hopefully we can – February's right around the corner and get you a new episode. But we need more questions to do an episode. Absolutely. And uh, World Wars, folks, so tons of questions you can ask. Um, and just, you know, keep it coming. Keep uh, our, our subscription list keeps getting bigger. So thank you for everybody who's yeah. supporting us. Absolutely. And uh, we'll uh, talk to you next time. Holly History signing off. Thank you for joining us.